I've got my um, I've got my speech notes here, and 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 I probably won't stick to them. Uh, and and one of the reasons why I probably won't stick to them is that um, I'm sitting beside George Davy and Winston Watt. And I think back to when I was uh, being formed, if you like, um, in the Australian dairy industry. And, and indeed, um, when we were having discussions about the merits of deregulation and, and, uh, and indeed, probably quietly, there was those in the industry that might have been predicting that poor old bigger cheese down there on the lower south coast of New South Wales with 1% of the milk and... Um, you know, a naive young chairman and uh, and three odd thousand tons of, of product were not long for this world, and it was probably not an unreasonable assumption. Um, but interestingly enough, we always uh, or I always found help and support and a willingness to share thoughts and ideas. And I've always been very keen to say to my people, um, and indeed almost anybody that will listen, that it's extraordinarily important, um, and actually Australian males aren't very good at this, to be willing to share your dreams and share your fears. And when I think back to those early years, I had great dreams for Bega Cheese, which I would share with everybody. They would politely listen, um, and I think they'd probably sometimes go away and go, well, you know, He's, he, he's going to try, but he's got a hell of a big um, wall up against him. But they would also, whenever they saw me next, give me advice about how I might improve what we might want to think about. The, the interesting thing about that is that that included many of my competitors. That included many of the very large established companies that would talk to me about what I might want to achieve, and indeed, when I shared with them my fears about whether I could or not, would actually provide me advice on how I might overcome those fears and those concerns. So we indeed built a business with the help of many. Um, and the reason why I make that comment is that loyalty, trust, are the things that I think were the foundations of Bega Cheese and how, and how we managed to go forward. And Ben's right, it was, a, it was an interesting path forward. And if you think about what that might have looked like, as we came into deregulation with uh, the Australian supermarkets uh, consolidating and moving to national procurement um, models uh, with, with Bega, having the rights to its brand just in New South Wales and only having um, cheese to, to supply that state and having a rather awkward um, um, national, national um, brand franchise, uh, decided that it would do a deal with, its, with what people should describe as its biggest competitor or one of its potentially biggest competitors in Fonterra. And we did that deal and it was a deal that allowed us to strengthen our position. It was a conservative deal. It, it, it involved us trusting um, somebody else with the stewardship of the brand in Australia and it involved us consolidating, which has always been my great belief, consolidating uh, an element of the supply chain, being cheese cut pack and processing, into, into Bega. It created cash flow, created stability, created strength. We shared that with our farmers. In those days, it was just our Bega farmers. Uh, and we set about building a business. We set about being alert and agile, and I guess to a certain extent, humble. And I still think that humility is extraordinarily important in business. So we actually got stronger and stronger and stronger in those early 2000s. And by about 2005, I started to think that our business model, as wonderful as it was, was extraordinarily replicable. And in fact, if you're making a lot of money out of, out of anything, you know one thing for certain. Somebody else is going to start trying to make money out of it. Somebody else will attack that point of, of your business. So we started to look around for acquisition in the middle of a 10-year drought in the middle of extraordinarily difficult circumstances uh, for not only our own farmers, but farmers across the country. Uh, we went and looked at Tatura Milk Industries, a business that everybody else said was ruined, that had nowhere to, had nowhere to go and indeed was in Northern Victoria where there was no milk and the milk was reducing because of the drought. 
Um, so we bought in Doom, I guess, if you like. So in 2000, we made a deal when everybody thought we wouldn't exist. In 2007, we made another deal where we said we can change this company. Um, we, can, we can bring the skills that Bega has and we can embrace the skills that Datura has uh, and actually start to create something of formative size and scale in cheese, infant formula uh, and, and nutritional milk powders. Um, we were obviously successful, so we got a little bit confident. And we, and we, but we kept going. We are successful because of our relationships with others, particularly our relationship with our customers, who on many occasions were also our competitors. And that's something that people had, had not been able to get their mind around. And interestingly, by 2009, we had um, done a deal with Kraft, another big player, another big competitor, uh, and bought yet another cheese cutback and processing facility. So we'd be, be become by far the largest, the most competitive, the most relevant player in that platform. Relevant and competitive are the two words that I keep talking to my, my teams about. The reason is that I think there's a great temptation always in dairy. Milk is a wonderful product and you can make many wonderful products out of it. But our view has always been we need to focus, we need to be very, very good at one thing and when we think we're very, very good at that, add another. And, and, and that relevance, that capacity to be competitive has always delivered a stability to our business. Um, a really important stability in times of great difficulty. It's allowed us to, to support farmers when needed. Doesn't mean it's allowed us to beat the market. We know it's a tough time for dairy farmers uh, this year. Fortunately, we're looking at improved pricing next year. But the, but the reality is we are we know that in the year just past that we've had many farmers find it very difficult. And when I'm speaking to them and they hear the stories of big cheese success, they of course say, but it's very difficult on farm and, you know, why, why can't you beat the market? Why can't you um, um, pay us more? And I always say to them, rather humbly and rather sadly, that it's never been done. And quite frankly, uh, a demonstration of that occurred a year ago when we did have a business out there saying they could beat the market, they could pay more than what the market would return. And I'm not going to dwell on it, but what the, the consequences of that showed just how, bad, how, how, how dangerous and incorrect that can be. The most important thing you can do is reflect the market. Of course you always want to try and improve returns to farmers, of course you always want to try and improve the returns to your business, but we are in a global market. This industry is in a global market. We trade in global dairy products uh, and even the products sold in Australia are deeply affected by what happens in the global market. So my perspective is it's always really important to work on trust with your farmers, work on loyalty with them and know that occasionally they will be disappointed. But it's also important to not lose sight of what your strategy is. So we buy Kraft in 2009 and we become larger. And everybody, I think, by then is quite surprised. We also buy a cheese factory in, uh, in Melbourne at Coburg. Uh, so we've now moved from this small single site operation and quite frankly with a 30 year old cheese factory that, um, that, that struggled to handle our milk um, in that first year that I was chairman to, to five sites, um, some significant business strength, um, and sites on consolidating further the Australian dairy industry, which I, I still believe uh, is necessary. Uh, and I don't want to sound like some sort of corporate um, textbook, but I still believe that we can do really smart things if we, if we think about how we can be relevant and competitive, not only in this country, but in, but in the Asia region and beyond. So we knew that Warnerville was, was potentially a, a, the next target for us uh, and we knew that we created a lot of value so we decided that we needed to restructure the company. To turn from a cooperative to a publicly listed company and do it seamlessly is something that looks easy on the outside. Um, but indeed uh, we executed that very seamlessly and I think it's demonstrable today that all those things that sometimes are spoken about cooperatives and feared about listed companies or indeed market-based companies can be proven wrong when you look at bigger cheese. Where it's been able to get the balance right 
between how it respects and manages its farmers and indeed how it manages external investors and shareholders. That move in 2011 created enormous value for our, for our farmer suppliers and we're very proud of that to this day. Um, it also created the structure that allowed us to launch a takeover bid on Warnerbull. History says that we were not successful and that's fine because you can't win them all. But, yeah, but, but I think it's important to be able to run on the field and play. One of the things that that did do when we ran on the field and played is that the whole value of the Australian dairy industry got re-rated. Everybody started to value dairy and dairy, dairy structure and dairy infrastructure at a greater level. Indeed, the market valued bigger cheese much higher. So when I fast forward to um, uh, earlier this year, where had we got to? Well, we had one of my frustrations when we had this wonderful infant formula capacity was that we didn't have a, uh, the ability to put it into a retail pack. So we, did, we, we built a sixth site that was able to can infant formula so we could do the same things in infant formula as we could do in cheese. Um, we were a very well developed business. But interestingly, what people have maybe missed is that we had six sites that we consistently invested in really strongly. Three of them handled milk. The other three were, in fact, food processing and packaging facilities. They handled ingredients and they added value to those ingredients and they put them out to a, to, into a retail pack for a destination to a market anywhere in the world. So when we started to look around at what our next acquisition might be, and when we started to think about the evolution of the company, we started to say, well, increasingly, because of our size and scale, we're dealing more with Australian retailers. We're dealing more directly with brands and less with, with, with an intermediary that, 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 provides a, um, that provides a marketing service or whatever else it might be. The retailers want to talk to us. Whether we like it or not, the market had changed from 2000 to 2017. The next evolution was necessary for bigger cheese. We had to start thinking about being a branded player in, in the Australian market. We had to add more capability as a branded player for both the Australian and international market. So if you, were th if you were me and you were thinking about this and you thought about your core strengths and you said, well, I've got really good strengths in food processing, uh, food packaging, managing ingredients, also got really good strengths in milk, but maybe people have missed the other strengths that this business has slowly but surely developed. Um, and what I need is really good capacity in marketing, selling. You might start thinking about other food businesses. And if you were that, and you did think about your relationships, and I'll quickly rewind you back to 2009 and the friendship that had developed with Kraft at that time. And indeed, when Kraft and Mondelez demerged and, that, and those relationships moved to um, Mondelez, we were always careful to maintain them. As I say, I've always, been, I've always believed in the value of humility and, and respect uh, in business. So I always went to Chicago and saw my, uh, one of my biggest customers, always made sure I spoke to them, even if it was just to, to thank them for their business and make sure the relationship was OK. Um, but I might have also suggested to them on occasion that they might have other things that I might like to buy. And, and there might be some logic in that. And there, might, and there might be an opportunity to do that very, very quickly and very confidentially. Uh, and if you, were, if you were an Australian food player such as me that thought you wanted to be in brands and thought that you needed to, to leverage your strength in processing and thought you wanted to add to not only marketing and sales but R&D, I think you'd probably say, well, what would be the top of the list brand that you could buy in Australia that is unassailable, that people won't buy a generic from? that any other person that's tried to compete against has failed. Even people with the greatest of goodwill that wanted to paint pictures of it, you know, of it being owned by an evil multinational, whatever else it might be, it's Vegemite. Do we have a relationship with those people? Yes. Can we talk to them about what we might, how we might do it? Yes. So that's what we set out to do. The market was surprised. Surprised in the positive, but it's interesting to me that the market looked at us and went, uh, we weren't expecting that. Um, but they also looked and said, gee, you've just bought a whole series of quality assets. You've just, strength, you've just added to your bench strength, for want of a better way of putting it, um, and you've just separated yourself 
from, from, from the sharks, if you like, and where the sharks are swimming and fighting. And so the response was accordingly. My, my view is that you know, the integration, which is, which is still underway, will see our business strengthen substantially. Uh, it will significantly strengthen our bottom line and it will help us deal with volatility. Uh, it is a challenging industry, the dairy industry, and the challenge is going to be well and truly upon us next year. Uh, it is sad for me to see the uh, trust, loyalty and confidence leave this industry last year. We need to win it back. Um, part of winning it back is behaviour. Part of it winning, winning it back is something that is unfortunately not entirely within our control, but at least we've got positive signals to say that uh, we will see improved pricing next year. And the one thing we do know about uh, farmers of all ilks, they'll respond to the right price signals. We will see some recovery next year. We need to see recovery beyond next year, obviously. But the dairy industry itself next year is going to be extraordinarily competitive. When you think that 750 million litres has disappeared out of a, out of a, around about a, a now, a, now a less than nine billion dollar, nine billion litre industry, you realise that those that are playing, those that are serious, uh, those that want to grow and develop their businesses, because I am very keen to always say Bega Cheese is a growth company, uh, they will go out after that milk. They will go out, they will compete. And the irony is that competition is a positive for farmers. It does see that that will be pushed very hard. So we will all be out there competing. There might be one competitor that, that's slightly weakened or weakened, but the others uh, are all there going, um, we need milk, we're chasing it, we want it, um, and we're trying, to, we're trying to make sure, and we know that price signals will be extraordinarily important in all of that. So I sit, stand here today and say um, probably two things. I'm very proud of the, the, the way we've, we've been able to grow the business. Um, I had a, a friend in GE once that used to say to me, uh, look, mate, and he was actually, he was actually the, the, I think he was the first CEO of GE in Australia, and he used to say to me, mate, business is not rocket science. And I know, because GE builds rockets. And, and, and I would go, fair, and the truth is there isn't rocket science in what Bega Cheese has done. There is, a, there is an underlying view of ethics, there's an under, under, underlying view of um, sort of business practice, which does include those subject, the subjects such as loyalty. There is an underlying view of having a dream, which in more corporate terms would be, would be described as a vision, but, describe, but, but talking about vision isn't emotional enough for me. It's about a desire, it's about a dream to make something different, to actually challenge what the future holds. And I, I think that's what we've done. We will continue to do so. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of questions, but I, 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 I have sort of rambled a little here, but what I, would, what I would probably say is that as I stand before you, I think about the mega trends going forward. I don't think of, gee, isn't that good? I've done that deal, I can take a rest. I think we need to get this deal done and we need to be ready for the next and we need to be ready for what is an ever-changing market. Uh, we need to recognise that our customer is, both here and internationally, is concerned about issues of provenance. They are concerned about issues of trust in the supply chain to their, to, to back, back to where, the, where their, their product originates from. There is changes in behaviour, whether it's driven by urbanisation, whether it's driven by technology, um, or any of the other mega trends, that there are changes. There are changes also in the way in which you interact with your staff. The way in which you create, or, or indeed, and maybe a better way of putting it is that um, I don't believe you create great companies. I believe you create great people. And they create the great companies for you. So as we think about how we move forward, we have to think about not only our customers, but how we inspire our staff by our behaviour, by, what we, by, by the products we make, by the way we enter a market, by the way we deal with the customer, by the way we deal with our staff. We need to create that thought leadership. So in the future, we will continue to build this company. So, so I, um, I probably haven't given enough colour and movement into, into why Vegemite, but I hope I've given you a sense of it. Uh, we are very proud. People, people did ask me, um, 
on the day that uh, on the day that uh, we took it uh, took or on the day we announced the deal, how I felt to be the Australian that that led the team to bring back Vegemite. And I've got to admit, I kind of hadn't thought too much about it because I'd been in deep in the deep in the transaction. And even when I was asked, I kind of thought it was a bit too um, self-congratulatory to make any sort of grand statement. But I was um, extraordinarily touched, and this perhaps tells you where our roots come from. When the mayor of Bega, you know, a town of 5,000 people, and I'm sure, and I'm not sure what the journals will write here, but please forgive me this statement, I don't really worry about local councils that much. And the, and the, and the, so when the mayor of Bega released a press release, I, it wasn't really one that I looked to read straight away. I read much later that night. And the press release said some really nice things about Bega being the heartbeat of the town and how indeed we'd gone from 80 to, to I think, more than 900 staff in Bega itself. Um, and all the, all the ensuing benefits and how that had made such a difference to the town. But she said, what I'm most proud of is that Bega, a town of 5,000 people, is now the owners, and it's interesting that the town thinks they own beaches, but is now the owners, is now the owners of two of Australia's most iconic brands in Bega cheese and Vegemite. And as I quietly sat there, I thought, you know what, that's okay. That's not, a, that's, that's not a bad thing to read late at night after a lot of hectic hard work by a lot of people.